welcome back to the nonprofit show. You know, I like to say welcome back because I just assume that you've all been here before, but if you haven't, we are thrilled that you're here for another episode. Today we have with us Barbara O'Reilly, CFRE. And Barbara, I'm thrilled to have you join us today. Barbara serves as the founder and principal at Windmill Hill Consulting. She's brought her soapbox with us. So if you looked at her LinkedIn profile yesterday, you saw that navigating declining donor rates is a topic she talks about every day that ends in the word day. (laughs) So I absolutely love this because that means every single day of the week, you're talking about this and you're on your soapbox. So before we get started to learn more from Barbara, we want to say hello to all of you. If we haven't met you before, Julia Patrick is here. Hello to you, Julia. She's the CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. And I'm Jarrett Ransom, honored to play alongside day in and day out as your co-host, Julia. I'm also the nonprofit nerd and CEO of the Raven Group. Together, we are honored to have the continued support from so many of our amazing sponsors. So a shout out of gratitude to Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Fundraising Academy at National University, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Your Part-Time Controller, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Nerd, as well as Nonprofit Tech Talk. Do yourself a favor and check out these companies because they are here to help you do more good in, around, and throughout your community. So they have helped us to produce a plethora of episodes past 900 if you've joined us before and you can find all of them right here on these various channels so you can find us on podcast streaming broadcast and then if you want to you can go ahead and scan that qr code download the app and later today you'll get a notification that this conversation right here right now with barbara o'reilly is shared and uploaded on that site so Again, thrilled to have with us, I like to call it the hot seat, Barbara, but it's really not that hot because this is your area of genius. Uh, But Barbara O'Reilly, CFRE, joins us. She's founder and principal, Wind Hill Consulting. Welcome. Thank you, Jared. Thank you, Julia. I'm delighted to be here and to be able to have a chance, Jared, especially to extend our conversation that we started uh, down at Ray's in Nashville. I'm so glad you mentioned that. I teased it a little bit earlier. You're right. So we connected at the One Cause Raise Conference in Nashville. We had you on for a little bit of a segment uh, there at the conference as we are broadcasting live from the studio uh, there on the conference floor. So hopefully our viewers and listeners got a little bit of a taste, uh, but here we're going to get a little bit more. So Thrilled to hear from you about this because, Julia, we've both been hearing this, especially about the Giving USA report, yeah, that donor numbers are down. And mm-hmm. this seems frightening. What does this mean, Barbara? Yeah, it's, um, you know, we've seen over the last um, uh, year for sure this sort of um, th- this, this, these mixed messages. So, on one hand, we see you know, um, record numbers of, of dollars that are contributed, right? And we, and especially Giving USA has been tracking this for um, certainly the last easily 40 years. We saw, you know, the, the numbers from 2020 to 2022 increase. Um, each year was a new record amount, estimated amount that was contributed to nonprofits. Um, there were headlines in, for this year's release uh, um, when it came out in June that was saying, you know, philanthropy is down. It, it was down, but adjusted, right, from two nice. record-setting years. And when we're talking about it, contributed dollars to nonprofits was about half a trillion dollars. So that's really not, that's not anything to worry about and think, oh my gosh, the nonprofit sector is at huge risk. Where we are at risk, though, is the declining number of donors. And so it feels a little bit in Congress, you know, we've got amount, you know, these record dollars that are being given, but yet under the surface, the donors are declining. And this is a trend that we've been seeing for the last 20 years. Uh, on uh, Since for the last 20 years, we've seen the number of donors declining by about 20% <clears throat> willing to decline. We've seen this along the, the same trend lines with volunteers. Um, and in fact, the Giving Institute uh, has been working closely with the Get Generosity Commission to dive into this very, you know, this the last time the Generosity Commission convened was back, I think, in the 70s or 80s. Uh, this quite a bit of time ago. And so it was starting to look at what are those underlying causes? Because 
it is, you know, while we are, um, uh, you know, a, a strong sector, we are, we are operating in the larger ecosystem of everything around us. Uh, and our, our societies have changed, our communities have changed. Uh, and in one part, I think the declining number of donors is part a factor of all of that. Um, but I would also say it's part of what we're doing as nonprofits and as fundraisers to engage with our donors. And so part of it is not is out of our control, but part of it is very much in our control of how we are connecting with our donors, keeping them around, and frankly, paying attention to whether or not our donors are sticking around. So I have a question, and this is coming from a little bit of the left field. Um, and excuse me for the baseball reference, but my team is now in going to the World Series. So I, I have to bring Congrats. it up every day until the World Series is over. But my, you know, I think that the philanthropic actions of, of large donors, you know, mm -hmm. the wealth market and mm -hmm. corporations is so tied and so masterfully managed by PR. Mm. And so I wonder when the average school teacher, you know, middle-class American person keeps hearing about all these super gifts if they're like that's i can't compete with that that's being taken care of they've solved a problem i mean versus that old school like march of dimes every dime counts we all need to row in the same direction that's just an observation and i'm wondering if you have a sense of that as well or what that what that action or those actions might actually be doing to the donor environment? Yeah, I would say um, that's a really interesting question. And I'm of two, two minds to that. So first I would say it actually doesn't, they're not related as much as we would have think, we would think because um, we're looking at different paths to generosity that have really exploded over the last few years. So um, Facebook fundraisers, right, has raised, I think, $7 billion, right? And that's gifts of all sizes, particularly the everyday and micro donations. Mm -hmm. um, there's uh, GoFundMe, I think, raised in 2022, um, it's several billion, several tens of billions of dollars, I think. I, I'm not going to get the number correct, but it's an incredible amount, right? Yeah, yeah it's, it's a lot. So, um, and that's, again, everyday donors who are giving partly to nonprofits, because I think about 50% of those who are giving through GoFundMe are giving to nonprofits. Other About 50%, 57, 60% of those are giving to nonprofits, um, informal groups, and individuals. So it's an extraordinary amount of money. So people are still generous at, low, at the less mega donors, uh, like mega amounts, than they are, than we think. Right? So I think they're not being deterred necessarily, but there okay. was... Um, on the other hand, there was a study, and I can't remember where I saw it, that did ask that very specific question. And there was, to me, a surprising percentage of respondents who said that they feel like those larger gifts are covering it, like there's no room yeah. for their, their giving. So I I didn't, I don't remember where I saw that, but, um, and I, so I can't have a sense of what that sample size was, who they were asking, um, the specific other questions that surrounded that mm. particular question. But I would say it's a point, it's a point to uh, keep in mind, particularly as fundraisers and nonprofit leaders to um, evaluate particularly our time and focus. So we aren't getting distracted by the shiny objects of whoever we're defining as mega gifts, whether it is the true Mackenzie Scotts of the world or our own orbit of mega donors, that we are really thinking about that whole um, community of supporters at every level mm -hmm. so that they all feel included and welcome and valued. Yeah. I really appreciate that response. And Thank Julia, you. that is a fantastic, interesting question. Never thought of that, of how, you know, PR goes into the mix. But Barbara, what about volunteers? Because the the number of volunteers are also dropping. So, mm -hmm. I mean, that to me just sounds like a recipe for disaster. Yeah. It can be for sure, uh, and there I, I'm not surprised that they're tied that they're or that they're sent, trending in the same direction as the number as the number of donors declining, okay. um, because we see a correlation for sure 
the your, your volunteers are going to be the most likely to be donors as well. But again, many nonprofit leaders say, well, we can't ask our volunteers for financial gifts because they're already giving of their time, which is the worst perspective to have because they're the ones who are the most likely to say yes to making a, a financial investment in that organization. Um, I, I think it goes back to how we as leaders and nonprofits um, are managing the expectations of our volunteers, how we're identifying what are the best uses of that volunteer time, because there is sometimes um, uh, a a feeling of um, compulsion. Somebody has said, I'd love to help. How can I help? And then coming up with something to make use of that person's time when in fact is probably not the best, right? And I remember talking years ago to a nonprofit who said, yeah, that that fence over there, that's been painted 10 times in this year because we have all these employee groups that want to do something. And right. so we figure we'll have them do it, paint that white fence. I mean, it was a great looking white fence, but because it's been, it was painted like every other month. So right. I think there's that balance of, are we giving enough? Are we, are we creating busy work for our volunteers? Because we want, we feel like we have to give them something because they've offered. Are we, um, are we, do we have the bandwidth to be able to figure out where is, what's the best contribution that they can contribute, whether it's um, uh, expertise or other networks or other um, capacities of their time that are going to still provide them value and the nonprofit. We, we don't, we shouldn't feel as a sector that we have to pro- come up with projects just because someone says, can I help? Because there's nothing worse than that volunteer saying, God, that was a waste of my time. They didn't right. actually need me. Right. And, uh, and then you've just lost that moment to create a, a, a really strong relationship. I love sadly the fence story. Yeah, <laughs> I think that is so relatable, you know, and I have been in many organizations. I'm sure all of us have mm-hmm. where it's like, Oh, what are we going to do with this 25 group, you know, corporate leaders that are coming in next week, let's just give them some more white paint and they can paint that fence again. Yeah, Yeah. (laughs) for sure. Right. Instead of sort of thinking about, are there skills uh, or sort of technical expertise that we need? Is there something, uh, are there other gaps in our staffing capacity or in our wish list of it would be great to have that could be filled on a short term or a longer term basis by outsiders, um, you know, outside volunteers who would would have it. And then in fact, doesn't that change the way we think about who we're recruiting as volunteers? Absolutely. Um, yeah, so, that level. So yeah. we've talked about donor, you know, amounts that that dollar amount is going down. Volunteer engagement is going down. We have one more decrease and that's the decline of donor retention rates. What is the current donor retention rate? Like what, what is it we're striving to achieve right now? So um, let me ask you both a question. Do you know what the hospitality customer retention rate is? You know, I don't, but I love where you're going on this. (laughs) I do too. I'm like, I know. I I don't know it. Hair on fire moment. Okay. Let, let us know because this is great. I thought the white fence was good. (laughs) <laughs> so the hospitality industry uh, last year cited a, re- a customer retention rate of about 70% or something more than 70%. Wow. Uh, and many retail um, outlets, uh, sh- stores, online uh, retailers have generally sort of an 80 to 90% roughly. Um, the nonprofit sector, right? The, the sector that's oh. doing good, that's kind of a, a an anchor in... Um, community services and in bettering the world has on an average retention rate of 40%. Oh my gosh. So, that hurts. That I hurts does. so I'm bad. I'm just like sick to my stomach. And yeah. I'm sick to my stomach that I don't, that I didn't know that. I mean, I know it's bad and I know it's a problem and we need to pay attention, but not to have a hard number. That's even worse. It's been going down. Um, it was 50% at some point, not that long ago, I'd say probably in the last 10 or 15 years, okay. uh, and it has been steadily declining. So it's somewhere between 40 and 43%, depending on when you look at those numbers. But for those first-time donors, and we saw a surge of first-time donors within the last three years, on average, only 20% of those are sticking around. So think about that churn. We have those first-time donors who are inspired by something they see, 
They right. make a gift of any size and 80% of them on average are not coming back. Now, of course, that wildly varies from nonprofit to nonprofit, but it's that churn of um, new donors who take that first step to invest in an organization. Those who have been around uh, for at least two, three gifts who are most majority 60% or so on average are not coming back. That churn is what is, is holding us as a sector back. And um, I would say that many nonprofit leaders and fundraisers are not designing their systems and designing their strategies to focus on that metric. We're, I, and I get it. We're all focused on how much money do we need to raise? Are we hitting our budget goals? Because that's, of course, important. But are we looking behind under the surface to say, how, what, where is that money coming from? Mm -hmm. And there are so many times when we're working with organizations and we start with that very metric uh, to yeah. understand that. And if it's, yeah, we're hitting our dollar goals, great, but it's churned because they've got 30% retention. We got to fix that quickly so that those donors are sticking around. And the longer they stick around, the more likely they are to increase if they feel like they're welcome and they're valued and their gift is a, is, is doing good. Um, and if we if we lose those donors, the chances of them coming back are slim. So we are we've got to think rethink our mindset around these donors so that it keeps them around longer. So Barbara, what is the hospitality industry and the retail industry doing differently than what we in the nonprofit sector aren't doing yet? So a, a whole lot of things. Uh, <laughs> Clearly, that's. <laughs> <a whole> <laughs> <laughs> That's another show. But That's, I mean, yeah, I, yeah, I would love to know. I mean, because we don't think about this. Right. No. We don't okay. talk about it. So think about like Amazon, right? Mm -hmm. um, whether you love them or hate them. They you go onto the app, it it has been tracking your your shopping preferences. It's suggesting stuff. It's making it super easy. So the user experience is easy because you can either do one click shopping or you have got maybe at most two clicks. Um, it's, uh, it is um, providing recommendations based on what it understands. It has learned over time. So it's using data. It's looking at that end result of, I wanna make sure that this customer comes back and has an easy and, um, and um, simple exp you know, user interface with this platform, with, with what it's looking for. Um, it has, um, it, it's using the, the tech and the automation and the and the AI, if you would, to understand who that donor, who that customer is. Um, think about Netflix, right? It's constantly saying, "Hey, you've watched this. Maybe you would like this." Right. And it and so it part of it is um, the the actual process, the user interface of how you are interacting with whatever that whatever that retailer is. But it's the other of understanding who I am as a consumer. Uh, and we don't do that enough in our sector. Partly, partly it's resources. I completely yeah. just kind of put that out there. And this is not a criticism at all, but we have so many tech tools and AI capabilities at our fingertips now more than ever that are accessible and affordable. Yeah. And so it's again, changing Absolutely. our mindset that using automation, using AI to understand a little bit more about who our donors are so we can offer a personalized communication with them, even just at a, that baseline. That's what we're missing. Um, we're not asking our donors enough about what they're interested in. We're not then collecting that information and using AI, using CRMs to say, that donor said they want to learn more about our, uh, our scholarship program. Let's feed them information about our scholarship program. Let's invite them to our scholarship recipient, you know, award ceremony or yeah. whatever it is. Right. That's where it, it's as simple as that. There's many more uh, reasons, but I, at the base, that's what we're talking about. So, you know, we could talk to you, Jarrett and I, are, we're <laughs> I mean, our time is almost up, which is shocking and, and sad, but um, cause you've given me like at least three hair on fire moments, um, which that's a good rating. She's that used means... to having one, <laughs> never three. So this and now is my hair a is white. So, yeah, and <laughs> so you can see what has happened with the hair on fire. It's turned my hair white. Um, you know, so much of this has to do with 
keeping the wolves at the door from the door. You know, we're, we're trying to protect our organizations. We're trying to raise money frantically, uh, limited resources. We know the drill, mm -hmm. but then we have this piece of, of customer service that we don't talk about. That's mm -hmm. why I love that you let in with the hotel concept mm -hmm. because we've all, we can understand what that experience could be. Right. Yeah. So how do we look at that donor experience versus money raised and, and stop the fear so that we can be thinking about that donor experience? I mean, do you have to get to a certain point where you can think about the donor experience or do you have to start with that and then hope that it raises the money? Chicken yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think you need to, I believe that you need to start with the donor experience. You've got to okay. understand, um, you've got to understand what your donors are coming to you uh, and sharing their generosity for, for what end, right? It isn't just your mission. They are, you know, we've got these core human needs about, um, our, you know, being our best selves of um, having connection with each other, of being able to exercise our autonomy um, and our, our ability to feel competent and then being connected with others, whether it's other donors like ourselves who are, who are passionate about the same cause, whether it's with the organization, whether it's with those who are served by the organization, all of the above. Mm -hmm. And without that donor experience front and center, the money will not come or will not come in the ways that we need it to. Mm -hmm. um, and it doesn't have to be, you know, I get, it doesn't have to be the the hyper-personalized um, experience that, you know, I mean, there's a difference between walking into the Ritz and walking into, you know, a, a, a more budget. I'm going to just, I'm not going to, I'm not going to name any of the budget, but a budget hotel, right? right, right. Two totally different experiences. Yeah. And it doesn't have to be like that. It could be as simple as looking at how do you say thank you? Uh, do you write a, on behalf of the board of directors? If you do, that's got to strike it from your from your um, your vernacular because nothing says transaction than put me in uh, you know face to face with your your volunteer leaders again. No disrespect to volunteer leaders, but I'm giving to that organization because of the mission. Everything else around it that's that's related to it is is not what's driving me. I'm not drive, I'm not giving because, oh, I see those 10 people are on the board. I'm giving because of the cause. And so we've got to be thinking about how we keep our donors close to our mission through our communications and, and making it more personal. Something like that. Also seeing who am I, who am I giving to? Why am I giving? Understanding that. Those are don't don't cost a lot. They are um they they could be very easy automated surveys, tech things. As he, or even as simple as let's do an audit of all the ways we talk to our donors and yeah. do we sound like human beings who are writing this? Do we, are we clear? <laughs> are we only talking about ourselves or are we asking and creating and trying to invite a dialogue? That doesn't taste, cost a lot of money. Um, and that's where we need to really be thinking about how we rebuild the way we talk to our donors. I think Honestly, that is probably the biggest takeaway for people watching and listening. If you do anything, take a look at how you're talking to your donors, right? Like an assessment, an audit. Barbara, do you recommend this annually, quarterly? I mean, hopefully we're looking at this as we're creating a piece. But if we have, and I know many of us do, a standard thank you letter, yeah. you know, are how often do we need to revisit this? Yeah, I think a standard thank you letter. Um, it's it's good to have it revised now. Um, you know, ideally, it's good to have it revised when you send out an appeal, so that it's there's a link at least to the message that was in the appeal and what they get on the on the back end when they've sure. made that gift. Um, I get though that not every organization mm -hmm. will have the capacity to do that. So at least a couple times, maybe once a quarter, take a look at that, um, yeah. or twice a year, mm -hmm. take a look at that. But you know, if, if you can't remember the last time you updated your thank you note, um, update it, update <laughs> yeah. it now. And also think about particularly those first time donors that, that, that retention rate, um, statistic is extra, should be extraordinarily shocking to people that on average, 80% of don't first time donors are not coming back. So 
think about that onboarding. How are you welcoming them? How are you telling them you made a great decision to invest in us and we're going to tell you a little bit more about ourselves and we want to know more about you so that we can make this a really strong partnership. The touch points, surveys, videos, all of those things that we already have at our disposal, we package that so that they feel that they're welcome right from the beginning. Barbara, I feel like I want to have you back on and do an entire episode about the hospitality and retail industries, how we can learn from these industries, because that's an experience we've all had. And you're so right. We can go at, you know, the five star experience. We can do a budget experience. Mm -hmm. There's no right or wrong. You know, there's there's certain touch points or certain experiences um, through both of those opportunities. So I don't know about you, Julia, but I think that's something we need. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think we don't use the word customer service mm-hmm. in the nonprofit sector. And yet at the core of it, you know, we say, oh, we want our don- our donors to feel valued and listened to and connected and all that. Mm-hmm. But really, when you think about it, it's a customer service issue. Mm-hmm. And if we started using that vernacular, we might understand how we can do you know, thoughtful, low cost, you know, yeah. issues or, or programs that help, you know, foster that um, because it's it's definitely a missing point. Mm-hmm. And I suspect that on both sides, the donor and the nonprofit, they don't realize what's happening. Right. right? They, they can't quantify, they can quantify it, but they can't qualify it. Correct. Say, wow, this is what occurred. And this is what we could do to change. Um, because we've all talked with disgruntled or not even disgruntled as much as like nonplussed donors that are like, yeah, I don't think my donation meant that much to them. Oh yeah. And right. that's the big reason that the, some, you know, the donations are declining is, you know, the report shared that the donors don't really see the impact of their dollars. They don't know to, that it's making a difference. And so you know, right. why, why would we continue? Right. And right. and that's part of doing that comms audit is to look at not just the language. Are we talking in a way that yes. that reader feels, wow, this was written for me, yeah. like, not tailored for every single donor, but it has to be a, as if it's a human exchange. Um, you wouldn't write to your grandparents and say, on behalf of my mother and father, thank you so much for your Christmas stocking. You know, I mean, who would write like that? Yeah. So, um, it, we've got to put that human element into our <laughs> communications, but especially Jared, to your point about impact, are we sharing points in our communications, whether it's uh, an e-update or a, an actual impact report or, or a, just a quick update letter or note, are we sharing it in a way that shows that before and after? Uh, doesn't mean volume of numbers of stats and progress. It's a before and after of a life changed, of you know, a, of a of a community turned around, of a student who has a different trajectory. Those stories are what are in fact going to stick with us more than the data and the metrics and the stats. That's important too. But you, in we're going to remember the stories. Like you're going to remember the white Thank picket you. fence story. Yes, and the other stats because that's how we're hardwired. Uh, oh and, my gosh! Yes. You know, I think that's where we have to, um, when we're thinking about our audit of communications, are we sharing in a way that shows a before and after? And and so the donor sees, oh, if I contribute at any amount, if this organization is going to help move the needle right. and whatever that causes. Right. right. Well, Barbara O'Reilly, CFRE, founder and principal of Windmill Hill Consulting. You have been a gem. We've really yeah. enjoyed this. I'm so delighted that... Um, you were able to jump onto the broadcast uh, when we were at the RAISE conference in Nashville and then to get you on full time. It's been a, a real pleasure. Oh, it's been uh, a delight. Joy. And, and I think Jared's right. We need to we need to explore a little bit more with you and, and, and get you back on to another episode of the Nonprofit Show. Again, I'm Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit um, Academy. Been joined today by the nonprofit nerd herself, Jared R. Ransom. CEO of the Raven Group. Again, we have amazing partners and they include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, your part-time controller, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Fundraising Academy at National University, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Nerd, and Nonprofit Tech Talk. Hey everybody, this has been a great episode. I say that a lot. Do I really believe like every day I'm like super energized and I learn something new? We do, Um, yeah. This was really fun, Jarrett, because we can see this shift happening, but sometimes we don't know how to articulate it 
or to correct it. And so, Barbara, you gave us some actionable ideas um, and things to really pursue when we look at how we can make this process better for all concerned. Hey, everybody, as we end every episode, we like to end with our mantra, if you will, and that is to stay well so you can do well. We'll see you back here tomorrow, everyone. Ladies, thank you so much. Thank you, Barbara. Thanks, Jared. Thanks, Julia. Great to be here.